This is SBS 335 Digital Anthropology, and what you're about to see is the first lecture for Module 1. In this short lecture, I'd like to go over with you some of the key elements of the reading that's been assigned for this particular module. And it, it is an important reading because it frames the rest of the semester in terms of the key concepts and ideas that we are going to have to be using to best interpret the digital realms and aspects of the digital life that we are going to be exploring. So let me um, start by exploring some of the key elements for the reading um, for this course. One of the, the main reasons why anthropologists are enthusiastic about exploring and creating this new subdiscipline of cultural anthropology is that the discipline is very well positioned because of its tools and trajectory in order to uh, be able to make sense of um, a phenomenon that is taking or has taken over our lives in, in ways that we couldn't fathom uh, a few uh, scores of years or decades ago which means a very, very rapid change uh, of profound consequences in, in the lives of people. And it is, of course, the, the consequence that brings to our lives the existence of digital tools that enables for communication and transference of uh, knowledge and things and, and trade and commerce in ways that were simply just unfathomable, not so long ago as I was saying. And at the end of the day, it really helps us uh, meet the main expectation of the discipline, which is to better understand what it means to be human. And is, is it um, the key questions is, is this new realm that we're living in uh, fundamentally different or is this just a projection of what we lived in the past? So those are some of the questions that we're going to be exploring this semester. The key for the reading is to sort of explore what are the main elements that uh, that an anthropological reflection can can bring to the fore so that we can better understand the digital life, the digital life. So let's first start by sort of giving you some clues for for the reading. I'm. My intention is not so much to give you every single detail that you're going to find in the reading, but just to signal some of the elements that are central in the reading so that you can better engage with it. So the idea is I give you some clues and an initial presentation of the principles. You do a deep reading. It's very important to do a deep reading of this first chapter, and then we're engaging in a conversation that hopefully will will help you process these in a critical manner and and see if you can agree with and to what extent the authors in terms of these being the main principles to understand the digital life so um the first tenet that uh, the authors are presenting is that um, the digital realm intensifies the dialectical nature of culture. So in order to unpack this uh, statement, the digital itself intensifies the dialectical nature of culture, I first would like to think for a moment about the meaning of, uh, of what is digital. When, you, when we talk about the digital uh, realm and the digital, what are we talking about? Then I also would like to uh, remember with you the meaning of the word dialectical and, and the nature of culture. So by, by talking about the concepts, we can unpack this first principle. So the digital refers to anything that is done by means of, um, of electronic communications based on, on this, dial, uh, this <laughs> dyadic um, transformation of data into ones and zeros. So anything that we can transform into ones and zeros and then communicate, recalculate, transform, that's what we call the digital. I think that in, in our minds, the digital becomes computers, becomes uh, the so-called um, uh, 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 
digital or, or virtual spaces, all of which is, is uh, enabled by technologies that are based on the transformation of data. And, and I think of it is quite interesting, the transformation of the perceived reality into ones and zeros that we can transfer and, and share with one another. That's a digital. So it's, it's fundamentally a new way of uh, transferring and mediating knowledge. And I will explore this a uh, little further in detail, but it is, um, we've done this from the get-go. Uh, that's the very fact that, that makes us human, is the ability to communicate in, in sophisticated manners. So other species do communicate, but we do that in a very effective and sophisticated manner. And we've gone through different stages in this uh, ability to communicate. Um, the historical ones are the ones that are best documented, but it is mostly those that, uh, that are represented in, in a graphic form. So it took originally the form of, um, of uh, virtual represent, no, not virtual, but pictorial uh, representations of nature. Think of the caves of Lascan in, in northern Spain. So those representations were meant to transmit, to uh, inscribe first and then transmit knowledge to others. And so it goes from paintings in caves to uh, gradually more and more complex symbolic arrangements that eventually uh, developed in languages. And those languages, then we transferred uh, uh, through generations and through different communities and through space and time by means of um, uh, elements such as uh, papyrus and, and uh, clay tablets, and eventually the creation of paper, which is the world that I was born in. Uh, I was born in, in, in a time in which everything that was written if it was transmitted, it was transmitted in the form of ink and paper. Think of that. But of course, uh, we also created other analogical ways of transmitting it, capturing images and, trans and transmitting it, sound and image, which was the radio and then the television. So I, I guess what I'm trying to share with you is that there's a continuum of technological development that eventually goes into this very interesting and potentially liberating ability to, to transform images and sound and, 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 uh, and text into a binary tool that is the ones and the zeros of the digital era of the computers. Um, what the first principle uh, states and explores and, and, and uh, explains is that the, what the digital realm, the, this fairly new realm that you were born already in, but it's very new. Uh, what, what this round does is it will intensify the dialectical nature of culture. So dialectical means that it has two elements that are combining, sometimes it is a clash, sometimes it is a combination that creates the elements for a new moment. That's how Hegel, and you will read about Hegel in the, in the first chapter. Hegel is this uh, German philosopher who was, uh, who thought that history was moving from one position, the uh, antithesis, which is the opposition to that position, and then from the clash, a new moment of synthesis would, would come about. And culture um, moves in that way um, uh, as, as its own nature. It, it, uh, it transforms itself in, in, in this uh, dialogue with the different elements that comprise the culture. If I want to be a little bit more clear, because you, you have to think of this, you're, you're born into a culture. When, when you're born, your, your family context is going to give you a language. It can be English, Spanish, Russian, whatever it is. And, and that culture embraces you and gives you the tool to navigate through the world. But once you're there and you have acquired these tools, then you are also an active agent of transformation of the very same culture. This generation, your generation, for example, different to mine, is, is ready and has uh, made fundamental changes. And it is ma making changes today to the way the job market works. You are willing to say, you know what, I'm not going to work under these conditions, so I'm going to resign and I'm going to move on and look for an alternative. Uh, the, what very recently they have called the 
the great resignation, right? So what is that? Well, it's not just people, many people resigning, but it is a cultural uh, decision, definition of what what is quality of life and what is acceptable and not. And your generation has made a decision to to uh, act in, in, in that way. If culture was an, uh, the solely decided, deciding factor in, in shaping the lives of people, then you wouldn't be able to make have made that change. But you, you're making that change, and then in doing so, you are changing the culture. So it's not just culture as, as, as an overarching uh, modeling factor, but you can um, dialectically remodel the very elements that shape your ability to model, so to speak. So this dialectical nature of culture is present and it's been expanded and it has been intensified by the digital tools that we live in. So it's that's the first principle. The digital is not different from the past, but it definitely it feels like uh, it has the ability and it has intensified um the the uh, changes in in culture so that is the first uh, digital uh, the first um principle so here's another uh, really interesting element that comes in the reading that i would like to sort of frame for you but you need to read uh, a little more the original authors of the book M miller and hearst They've done research in other areas of, of human life, particularly they, they were interested in, in the role that money played in, cult, in history, transforming societies. And if you think of it, money, it's a highly symbolic element of our lives that really generated abilities for the creation of, of uh, world systems, not just regional systems or, or local systems, but truly world systems of exchange. And um, money requires that uh, an act of belief uh, that is highly symbolical. And let me explain that. Um, I don't know if you use... Uh, uh, if you use uh, bills any longer, like a $1 bill or a $5 bill or a $10 bill, because people kind of stop using that. Uh, instead, we use cards more and more plastic, right? But you're familiar with dollar bills, right? If you compare a $1 bill and a $50 bill, its materiality is exactly the same. It's a piece of paper of the same size. And... Um, it's it's um, inscribed with ink. Maybe the ink is a little different, but the the intrinsic value of that piece of paper and and um, and the painting that is on the bill is the same. So, what makes I don't know if you ever thought of this, but what makes a fifty dollar bill be much more palatable than a, than a one dollar bill? They're the same externally. As objects, well, it's it's a belief. We believe that if we hold one as opposed to the other, that one will will provide more as an uh, for, uh, when we exchange that for things, right? It's and the other person, the person that's going to receive the bill from me, uh, believes the same. But if we both did not believe that, then it wouldn't work. If someone comes with a um, a rubble uh, or a uh, uh, un sol, which is a, a, a type, type of money in South America, and they give you that bill, even if the bill is bigger physically than a dollar bill, you wouldn't take that uh, in exchange for service or for, for something because you wouldn't know what to do with it. Because you both don't believe the same, you and that person. And maybe it's because of lack of knowledge on your part or lack of knowledge on the part of the individual that is giving you the money. But there's there's no, no uh, equivalence in belief. So money does that. It's a highly symbolical element. So they do, in the book, compare the new um, digital realms with money and shows how, much like money, 
um, the digital generates incredible new opportunities、uh, to the world. Um, and as such, it's, it's a really good, fair comparison. So it's, 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 worth,、um, it's worth exploring. And、um, another aspect that money, the, money the,、uh, made for humans is that it allowed for the commodification. That is, to transform、uh, things like、uh, a painting or,、um, or a glass or a rock into something that I can trade for something else. And that changed the nature of things. And all of this is highly symbolic. And, and that's what we need to pay attention to. So, so they, the authors want us to see how the digital realm has had or has brought to the human experience this amazing power on, or potential to、um, expand our horizons, horizons and abilities to trade and exchange. So、uh, that goes for the first、uh, principle. So let me move on to the second one is, is the、um, principle of false authenticity. And basically, what it is, is as you will read, that the authors will question this sense that the world that was before or outside the digital is somehow more authentic. Than the world in the digital. And the very fact that we've lived a year and a half because of the pandemics in a digital, digital arena in most of our trade and exchanges, that should bring to the fore and bring home the sense that、um, that is no less real. The fact that I'm dictating to my computer right now and you're not in front of me, it doesn't make any less real. The fact that when you're, when you're on the receiving end of this presentation, listening to what I'm saying,、uh, it would create a, a very similar, if not the same, effect in terms of、uh, enticing a relationship of,、um, of gaining knowledge and reflection around a certain topic, which is what happens in the classroom. So it's no longer the case that, or it's no longer accept, acceptable that we say the classroom is real and the online.、Um, The online realm is not real because、uh, it's just as real.、Uh, we are participating in this, in this、uh, new digital realm by taking、uh, part of this class and、uh, is no less authentic. So they are challenging this idea that,、um, um, that technologies are making this digital world less real than what it was. All right,、uh, moving right along, the third principle. So, it's important for, for us as anthropologists to remind you,、uh, and probably some of you have already heard of this, is the, the holistic principle in anthropology.、Uh, we believe in anthropology, in cultural anthropology particularly, that in order to understand the human experience, we need to bring understandings and knowledge from different, um, from different um, um, areas of knowledge. And, and that's a holistic approach. We need to understand the technology, how it works, and what it is. We need to understand location and geography. We need to understand psychology in order to bring all that together and be able to understand the human experience as what it is a very complex, multifaceted reality. So, we will bring this principle to the fore as we're exploring the digital. It needs to be holistic. Then the fourth principle that is deeply ingrained in, in North American uh, uh, anthropological traditions and others as well, but certainly in the, in the American one, is cultural relativism.、Um, but here's the thing cultural relativism、uh, presents the idea that、uh, different cultures across the planet have an intrinsic value, and we are not to judge the quality and the value of that culture. Based on our parameters only, but we need to understand their parameters. So, for in order to understand a, another religion or a civilization or a nation that is based on religious principles, if we use our Western principles, it'll be hard to understand. And,、um, but if you really want to understand that, then you need to try to see from within so that you can see the,、um, the world the way. The, the people that you're trying to understand sees the world. It doesn't mean that you have to embrace that world, 
But if you really want to understand it, then you need to see uh, the world from that perspective. So here's what's uh, challenging here in, in the digital realm. We have the impression <coughs> that, um, that the digital realm is going to homogenize our cultural spaces uh, so that the diversity will disappear. But it is clear based on the many ethnographic works that have been done and, and the experience that we have that each cultural space will, will transform the nature of the digital space to conform uh, to its own nature, cultural nature. But it will also give away some stuff and, and, um, and acquire, because we do that from, from day one, and acquire traits from other places. That, um, that exchange, cultural exchange, has always happened and will continue to happen in the digital uh, space, but not to the point that it homogenizes uh, life in the planet. There's just, it, it's not part of uh, being human and we will never get there. Um, there's no, no data that uh, points in that direction. A fifth principle is, is what they call the essential ambiguity of the digital. So that is, it's a space that is closed and it is open. So, um, and this is a principle that needs uh, a little bit of pause to try to understand. But basically what it is, is that uh, we need to see to what extent these this spaces, digital spaces where people living are spaces that are uh, enclosed spaces with its own uh, rules of engagement or whether uh, the digital actually opens these spaces in, in new ways. It goes from politics to privacy to authenticity. So um, we will explore this fifth principle in more detail. Um, and then uh, last but not least is the, that the, the principle uh, that the digital world is material. Uh, so I was giving you the example of this class. This class is no less real and material than the face-to-face -face class that we would have in, if we were in the classroom. It's just a different materiality, but it's just as real. So what happens on the internet, it's just as real. Therefore, uh, uh, the importance for, for anthropologists to come and explore these spaces, because it's like a new uh, agroecological area that humans are populating. Uh, just like humans populated almost every single corner of the planet because they were able to adapt to that place and adapt that place to their own needs, then the same happens with this new world, digital world. We are inhabiting it, we're adapting it, and we're adapting to it. So those are the six principles that we're going to use to explore and uh, try to better understand different aspects and arenas of the digital world. All right. And um, with on that note, on that positive note, I will uh, stop my presentation.